DCM stands for dilated cardiomyopathy. It is a genetically inherited disease in certain breeds of dogs. Irish Wolfhounds, Great Danes, um, St. Bernard's, Cocker Spaniels, which is the only small breed that we really see it in. So they're kind of an outlier. But a lot of the large breeds, boxers are, are huge on this. Um, it's a genetic problem. So somewhere between three and five years of age, they suddenly will have uh, decreased exercise. So we know when we see it in these genetically linked breeds, okay, great. We kind of expected that. He's a boxer. He's a Great Dane. So we kind of go, okay, well, that's a genetic problem. Well, when this all this whole thing started, a cardiologist from Tufts, I believe she's a cardiologist, um, said, oh, seems like we're seeing more dilated cardiomyopathy cases. And a cardiologist from UC Davis, so we got both sides of the country, said, oh, how about that? I think we're seeing more DCM cases. And for whatever reason, now, and why, this would be the first question you would ask people, like, because cardiologists never ask, what does your dog eat? All of a sudden, that was the only question. And they put out this big article. By the way, both of these doctors are funded by, all their research is funded by large pet food companies. So, hmm, is there a little bit of influence or bias going on. Um, and then they somehow got the FDA to post a list of about 20 pet food companies. And they only had 500, a little over 500 cases of dilated cardiomyopathy. And they did not even take out the cases that were breeds that were genetically prone to have this. So if we took those out, which was like 75% of them, we're left with, oh, look, we have 100 dogs, and there were cats thrown in there too, with dilated cardiomyopathy, and what are they eating? And so I don't even know if we if we re-looked at the list of foods after we took out all the ones that were genetically predisposed. I mean, we're not left with a lot. And when you consider that there's 160 million dogs and cats in this country, and we have 500 cases, if every pet eating grain-free food was going to develop dilated cardiomyopathy, we should have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of animals with dilated cardiomyopathy. And FDA let this stand and they threw these companies under the bus, which these company, one of the biggest companies, I guess, can I mention yes. it was Origin. Yeah. Origin lost 30% of their sales. They make Origin and Akana, it's champion pet foods. They lost 30% of their sales. Because when these doctors came out with this statement, they said, we are blaming grain-free foods because a lot of the dogs in the, and cats in the study were eating grain-free foods. They didn't take the raw feeders out and separate them from the dry kibble feeders. So raw foods were thrown under the bus too. And what happened is all these people who were feeding these beautiful, raw, high meat, species appropriate diets, all of a sudden we're going back into their local pet store and saying, no, I need to buy Purina. I need to buy Royal Canaan. I need to buy Hills. It has to have corn, wheat, and soy in it. Absolutely the wrong things to be feeding to our pets. We have no link. So in December of 22, so here we are four and a half years later, in December of 22, on the original post that FDA made about the link between grain-free foods, they put just this little new sentence in, very quietly, didn't announce it, no press release, no not. nothing, this little tiny, by the way, oh, we haven't been able to make any link at all between grain-free diets and dilated cardiomyopathy, case closed. No apologies to the companies they threw under the bus. But the interesting thing, and call me a conspiracy theorist if you want, but one of the big pet food companies that was behind this push for grain-free DCM-linked problems just happened to buy out Champion Pet Foods. And now all of a sudden it's not a problem. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, it's... I rest my case. Yeah, I mean, that, that's all there is to it. So again, you know... <laughs> So I was, you know, I've, I've worked in the pet industry, pet food industry for years. Um, and I was deep into it when this all happened. And it was just this blow up of these independently owned, truly nutrition focused 
brands that were impacted. And that honestly was, was heartbreaking to see, you know, these, these, these people in the industry that are actually doing things the right way. Um, they're actually formulating in a way that's optimal for dogs, species appropriate. And as you mentioned, the revenue losses that they, they incurred, they're still, I mean, companies went out of business. They're still not, and and that's, Mm -hmm. and that hurts us as a pet parent community, as a veterinarian community, more than I think we even realize because it makes it harder for people, individuals to create truly, truly nutrient dense, truly, truly appropriate species, appropriate diets um, to enter the market. This like barrier to entry, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a monopoly in my opinion. And this was just this oh, little uh, scam. I mean, it really, I think somebody said in the comments, like I feel scammed and that's, I mean, I, I feel it. Yeah. I feel it there with you. Well, the problem is the, it, it's ju- it's just like our government. You've got all these influencers, you've got, um, the packs and we have that in the pet food industry. There are pet food industry groups that represent big pet food and they have huge influence over FDA. They have huge influence over AFCO. And I mean, I've been to the AFCO meetings. I've seen that influence occur and, it is very unfortunate because they have so much influence with the veterinary community because they these big pet food companies spend so much money advertising within the, the veterinary community, giving free food to veterinary students, giving discounted food to veterinary employees. They really want everyone in the pet industry, particularly the veterinary pet industry, to have their pets on these diets. And that's a lot of influence. And if you are a student and that's all you get, if this is all you have coming in, guess what's going out over here? It's, oh, that's formulated by veterinarians. Well, there are many, many small pet food companies, independent pet food companies, raw pet food companies who have food formulated by veterinarians. And, you know, they're not just going out on a limb and throwing stuff in a, well, some are. I guess I should take that back. There are, there are some um, pet food companies that are not knowledgeable enough to have completely balanced, nutritious meals in the bowl. But saying that, unfortunately, I get reports every single day from clients, particularly from cardiologists, saying... My dog has to have grains in its diet. I did a a consultation for a veterinarian. She's an ophthalmologist. And so she worked in a specialty group. And her office was next door to the cardiologist office. This was maybe a year and a half ago. And she said, I need you to design a diet for my dog. I can't remember what the dog's problem was. And she said, the only thing I will say is I will not feed grain-free. It has to have grains in the diet because the cardiologist next door says so. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. (laughs) So I gave her my whole rant and breakdown of everything. She went, oh, and she did agree to feed a diet without grains. And I said, look, if you if you just really can't wrap your head around this, then this is the grain I would add. This is the amount I would add. And then you can feel better about it. But the, our, our pets and AFCO knows this and FDA knows this and the cardiologist should know it. Dogs have zero requirement for carbohydrates in their diet. Zero. What is a grain? Carbohydrate. Carbohydrate.